Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ariana Huffington, President and Editor-in-Chief, the Huffington Post Media Group. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm particularly excited to be away from covering this campaign. <laughs> it's like watching a split screen. On the one hand, is diminished expectations from our political leaders. And on the other hand, is growing expectations from our young leaders collected here. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And I'm here as a member of the media to say that we in the media also have a responsibility that we have not been doing our part to actually cover what is working, to put the spotlight on the good things happening. We are all, we are all, of course, covering everything that is dysfunctional, and there is plenty that is dysfunctional at the moment, especially here in Washington, D.C. But also, we need to do a much better job covering the incredible examples of ingenuity, creativity, compassion, empathy that you are demonstrating here today. This is our responsibility, and at the Huffington Post, we take it very seriously. That's why we have launched dedicated sections. One of them, which has become incredibly popular, is a good news section. It only publishes good news. So any good news that you have, Anything good that you are doing, please send it to me. I'm going to give you right now my email address. You can send it to me personally, and we'd love you to blog about it, to send us pictures about it, to send us video about it, to actually have a platform where you can celebrate everything good happening right now in your communities, in your neighborhoods, in America, around the world. So my email address is very simple, Ariana with one R and two N's, at HuffingtonPost.com. Easy, right? So the other section that we have is called Impact, and Impact is about all the things that are having an impact in the world, all the things that are happening by companies, by not-for-profits, by individuals. And another feature is called the Greatest Person of the Day, you can nominate someone who is doing something good and will celebrate them as the greatest person of the day, not of the year, but of the day. We need to celebrate the good obsessively. And the, <laughs> and the latest section, the latest section that we launched is called Opportunity. What is working? And we've partnered with LinkedIn, with Year Up, with the... <laughs> Hi, Year Up! <laughs> we love Year Up! <laughs> with, with Startup America, Venture USA, basically everybody that is doing something about creating jobs, because this is our big objective at the Huffington Post, to, take, to do our part to actually get companies, not-for-profits, foundations, and individuals do their part to create jobs. And you know why? Because we cannot just stand idly by waiting for Washington to solve this problem. We now have 23 million people in this country who are unemployed or underemployed, many of them young, many of them graduating from college, burdened with debt and not being able to get a job. I have two daughters myself who are in college, so I know how big this problem is. And we cannot wait for a knight on a white charger to come riding to our rescue. We just have to rescue ourselves. So our objective is twofold. One is to get major commitments, and we've already been very successful at getting commitments. For example, the Ford Foundation has very generously committed $150 million over the next five years to help close the skills gap. Because they're over, as you know, 
there are over 3 million uh, job openings, but somehow the people who are, who are looking for jobs don't have the right set of skills. There's a lot who can do about it, and there are some great people at community colleges, in corporations, in foundations, doing a lot about it. The Ford Foundation is committing $150 million to help. The Rockefeller Foundation is uh, launching a competition on the Huffington Post and on Twitter for the most innovative job creation idea. So anybody here who has an innovative job creation idea, please participate in this competition. And do you know how much you can get from the Rockefeller Foundation? One million dollars. <laughs> then, the Skull Foundation, who have partnered with the Skull Foundation, and their challenge, their competition, is among not-for-profits. If you are running a not-for-profit, and you have a job creation idea, as of October 1st, go to the Huffington Post. We are calling the competition Job Raising come up with an innovative idea for job creation among not-for-profits, and the Skull Foundation has committed $250,000, and we are raising another $250,000 through Edward Norton's organization, through the crowd, the people contributing to much what the Skull Foundation is doing. And there's a lot more, a lot more commitments, and they are coming every day. We're working... Uh, You've heard Alan Kazai and uh, John Brisbane, who's been speaking here. We are working with them to keep innovating around job creation. The second reason for doing that is that we need to change the narrative away from this fatalistic hopelessness that is permeating the country at the moment and towards the belief once again that, as John Gardner said, what we have before us are some breath taking opportunities disguised as insoluble problems. So what we need to capture is that spirit of the greatest generation. Uh, at both conventions, we had a lunch panel that Tom Brocco, who wrote about the greatest generation, moderated. And the greatest generation was really that moment in America when we faced our challenges head on and when people came together in extraordinary collective effort both to win the war and to rebuild the country after the war. And Tom Brocco spoke about how in his home there was like something sacred about the victory bonds that his parents bought. Tens of millions of Americans bought victory bonds to support the war effort even when they couldn't afford it because that's really the spirit of the greatest generation. That's the spirit that we need to summon again. And one of my favorite things uh, during one of the panels was what Walter Isaacson, the president of the Aspen Institute said, when he said, you know, every commencement speaker goes out there and tells you to follow your passion, right? And Walter said, you know what? it ain't just about you and your damn passion. <laughs> it has to be about something larger than yourself. And this is that moment when we can capture that and then make our lives have real significance beyond ourselves, beyond our immediate families, beyond our immediate circle of friends. That's really the moment. And it's in the zeitgeist. It's out there. When we tap into it, I really believe we're going to have the wind on our back and we're going to have that extension of grace that can quickly help us reach a critical mass, quickly reach that tipping point. And if there is anybody here, although I don't think there could possibly be anybody here who wonders what can one person do, if there is anybody, just a single person here who wonders that, I want you to contemplate being in bed with a mosquito. <laughs> Just a tiny little mosquito. And think how much havoc it can wrought. <laughs> so you're never too small to make a big difference. <laughs> and so I just want to end 
by going back to John Gardner. What we have before us are some breathtaking opportunities disguised as insoluble problems. So let's summon up that spirit of the greatest generation and go out there and solve them. Thank you. And now I have the best part for last. I'm going to introduce an amazing 22-year-old, Jordan Sparks. She gorgeous. <laughs> so backstage, you know, um, in the green room, uh, we were talking, and I met her amazing mother. Wait until you meet her mother. You know, we must bring your mother out here because, first of all, you will not believe it's her mother. Mom. Uh, Should mom. We bring her out yes. A can we? Can mom? we bring? <laughs> can we bring Jordan's mom out here? Come, we will, don't worry, we're not leaving until she comes out here. But She's probably having a heart attack right now. <laughs> she, was, she was telling, I asked her, how come the Jordan, who of course won the American Idol at 17, and then went on to make a difference in terms of many, many things, including malaria no more, and now this great new organization that she launched called MAD, Make a Difference, which is all about taking the legitimate anger that very often we feel when we are confronted with injustice, when we are confronted with all the terrible things around us and doing something about it. So I said to her mom, so how did that happen? You know, did you bring her up that way? And she said, yes. At Christmas, for example, she and her brother, they would bring in their presents and then they would have to give some of their presents away. Mm -hmm. And Jordan said, that's why she was sad every Christmas. <laughs> Trying to remember, oh, that's why I was crying. I had to get rid of my toys. But it's, it's good, though. My, my parents definitely instilled that in um, me and my brother when we were young, that, you know, if you have the platform, and even if you don't, just go out and do something for somebody else or go out and try to, to impact your community or to impact maybe even your friend if, if they need something. So it's all about just going out there and making that difference, taking that step to do it. In fact, you were telling me how one of your best friends, for example, can't get a job at the moment. Mm -hmm. So what, what does this mean for you? How do you deal with it? Um, it's been a little bit crazy because with my career and, and traveling all over the place, sometimes I don't really know about things until I get back home and so I was sitting with him for a little bit and just talking with him like how are you doing how's the job hunting you know he's been looking for uh you know he's been looking for a while and it's been really difficult for him to get a job and I know that there's a lot of um you know kids that I went to school with that are now you know either just about to graduate college or are out of college that are still looking for a job you know they have degrees and you know they can't find a job and what you guys were telling me is that you know they're 3.2 million jobs right now that yeah. are available and it just it doesn't make sense that there are people looking and can't find one yet there are so many available so it's it's difficult you know I'm, I'm still learning I'm myself learning about how to correlate the two and how to get them together and how to how to fix it um, but it takes more than one person you know it takes more than one person to get the voices heard and that's really the goal of MAD, right? So tell us a little bit about MAD. How did it come about? What is the idea behind it? Um, well, like I said, my, my parents, they instilled in us giving back, but MAD came about when in September 2009, I was going to New York City, and I went down a baggage claim, and there was TVs at baggage claim to watch, and the news was on, and it was about um, the story that they were telling was about Darian Albert. He was a kid who was just walking home from school in Chicago, and um, he was beaten to death. There was a fight and he was just walking past it and somehow he got pulled into it and he was killed and kids around him were videotaping and nobody did anything. And I just remember standing in the middle of baggage claim and I started bawling. And I went back to my uh, hotel and I called my mom and I was like, mom, I'm just, 
I'm so angry. I'm so mad that nobody did anything and that people just stood around. And that's kind of where the whole thing started. My mom, you know, she took that and she was at home, so she couldn't hug me, but she was thinking about it. And then she came up with, I'm mad at you. You know, you see something, you get mad about it. It stirs up your spirit and you go out and you want to make that difference. So you go out and you be mad. You go out and make a difference. So it's a play on words, but that's how it came And that's about. the hashtag. Uh, yeah, actually, right now, I, I asked all my Twitter followers right before I came out here to let me know how they're making a difference um, using the hashtag, I'm mad are you, which is another way that we can, you know, get things out. The internet obviously isn't going anywhere, and um, it reaches worldwide, so um, you, can, you can reach a lot of people that way, and that's how I use my Twitter as well, as I, I, I talk about things that I'm passionate about or um, organizations that I've partnered with, and so with the hashtag, now my fans can tell me how they're making a difference, and they'll say, this is what I'm doing, and they put the hashtag there, and then when people wanna know what the hashtag is, they click on it, and then they know that it's about making a difference. And also, you take an, uh, an emotion which you associate with something negative, like right. being mad, mm -hmm. and you are turning it into something positive, exactly. making a difference. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love the paradox of that. Thank you. Thank you. And as you look at your celebrity and your platform and using it for good, what is the message for people who may not have celebrity or platform but have that drive to actually make a difference in the world? Um, it's, it's definitely crazy because we were doing stuff, or me and my family, you know, we were going, you know, on Thanksgiving to go to the Salvation Army or different things like that before I even did Idol. So it was something that we were always really passionate about, but there's so many people out there who don't know, well, what can I do? Like, I'm, I'm just one person. How can I even impact the world or, or make that difference? And um, for us, what the, the I Matter You campaign does is just go out and do something. Like, for example, my brother, you know, once a week he goes and he reads to younger kids, you know, in elementary school. Or you can um, plant a tree. It's as easy as picking up a piece of trash or smiling at somebody and, you know, making their day. You never know what your actions are going to do. Um, you know, they can have a domino effect. So for me, I, I want to encourage them, you know, if you have that dream, just you know, discover, research, see what you can do. Maybe there's a solution that hasn't been tapped in yet. Maybe there's a different thing that you can do that nobody has thought of before. Um, but that's the amazing thing about, you know, young kids is that they're so creative and they're so innovative and they come up with such amazing ideas. So they can do anything as long as they, they believe in themselves and they go out and do it. So is violence against children and young people still the thing you're most mad about? Yes, actually. Um, I did a lot of stuff with uh, malaria no more right after American Idol and that was incredible um, and I've also gone back down there with Starkey Hearing Foundation and um, fitted a lot of people with hearing aids down there last March and that was amazing but I recently um, last year found out about Child Help which is um, an organization that helps keep kids from feeling like they're not safe and helps them feel protected and they have villages where some of the worst kids that are abused they can go and live and get an education and know that their past doesn't have to determine what their future is. Um, I went to some of their villages and some of the stories that I heard. I was so touched and I, I was crying and I was also angry and mad that there would be somebody who would hurt a kid. That's just something that doesn't sit well with me. Um, over five kids a day pass away from child abuse. And it's something that we all know, we just don't really talk about it because it's kind of taboo, it's very touchy. But that's something that I am involved with now. Um, I'm speaking out about it and, and raising awareness for that, that you know, kids to speak up if something is happening to them and to um, you know, let somebody know so they don't stay in that situation. So let's make a deal, you know. Um, I will get everybody at the Huffington Post to help with your cause, child health, and helping uh, against you know, violence towards young people. And can you help us with our cause, which is helping create jobs for young people? Yes, please. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that sounds like a good deal to me. So remember, um, Jordan's Twitter, would you give us your? Oh. It's just, again. it's just my name, Jordan Sparks, with an I, not with an A. Yes, J -R -D -I Jordan with an I. <laughs> Sparks. Um, and then if you guys want to learn more about I'm Mad Are You, it's facebook.com slash I'm Mad Are You. 
And um, you can also find Matt on Twitter as well. It's just slash I'm Matt Are You. Thank you guys for listening to me. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Thank you. And we will, so we will, this is just the beginning. We'll continue this conversation online. My Twitter handle is at Ariana Huff. And remember my email address, ariana at huffingtonpost.com. And just before we came out on stage, I made a prediction that uh, Jordan's mother captured on video. And I said that I predict that Jordan's destiny in terms of making a difference in the world is going to be infinitely more significant than winning the American Idol. Thank you. We have to get back here. And now, remember, Jordan's mom, we are not leaving the stage unless you come out here. Where is she? She can't be shy. She's your mom. Mom. mom can she okay. possibly be shy? You can come out here. Here she is. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. It's okay, hold on to me. I got you. <laughs> I got you. Don't worry. Isn't she fabulous? Let me go back here. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we'll put you in the middle. Oh, thanks for coming. <laughs> tell, tell us something about Jordan when she was little. Oh, she, and she was oh. naughty. Naughty. Hmm. Or anything. Jordan was very precocious. She got into everything. Um, she was, she was, you know, I'd see her on top of the kitchen cabinets. Um, she was always singing. She, she knew full-blown songs by the time she was 18 months old. She was potty trained really early. Um, <laughs> I knew she was going to be a star. How old, was, how old was she when she had her first boyfriend? First boyfriend. Wait, what? What is happening? First boyfriend. Um, well, she had her first crush, I think, in probably sixth or seventh grade. But first boyfriend didn't come until way later. What, 18? 18, yeah. Yeah, 18. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Go out there and make a difference.